Mr. President, in talking about the continuing recession tonight, you have blamed mistakes of the past, and you have blamed the Congress. Does any of the blame belong to you? Yes, because for many years I was a Democrat. I've been told that this is all off the record and that the cameras are all off. Is that right? Well, I was told that because I've been waiting years to do this. I have to interrupt right here and tell you that in one of my visits, I won't name him, I don't want to embarrass him, but one of the heads of state that I met with on this visit, he gave me one while I was on the way. Told me the story about the two fellows in the Soviet Union that were walking down the street, and the one of them says, have we really achieved full communism? Is this it? Is this now full communism? And the other one said, oh, hell no. It's, things are going to get a lot worse. He said that Castro was making a speech to a large assembly, and he was going on at great length, and then a voice out in the crowd said, peanuts, popcorn, Cracker Jack. And he went on speaking. And again, the voice said, peanuts, popcorn, Cracker Jack. And about the fourth time this happened, he stopped in his regular speech. And he said, the next time he says that, he says, I'm going to find out who he is and kick him all the way to Miami. And everybody in the crowd said, peanuts, popcorn, Cracker Jack. I'm sorry, the Soviet Union, who went out to one of those state collective farms, grabbed the first worker he came to, said, how are the crops? Oh, he said, the crops never have been better, just wonderful. He said, how about potatoes? Oh, he said, comrade commissar, if we could put the potatoes in one pile, they would reach the foot of God. And the commissar said, this is the Soviet Union. There is no God. He said, that's all right. There are no potatoes. <laughs> favorite quotations about age comes from Thomas Jefferson. He said that we should never judge a president by his age, only by his work. And ever since he told me that, I've stopped worrying. <laughs> Just to show you how youthful I am, I intend to campaign in all 13 states. President Washington began this tradition in 1790 after reminding the nation that the destiny of self-government and the preservation of the sacred fire of liberty is finally staked on the experiment entrusted to the hands of the American people. For our friends in the press who place a high premium on accuracy, let me say, I did not actually hear George Washington say that. I will not make age an issue of this campaign. I am not going to exploit, for political purposes, my opponent's youth and inexperience. <laughs> an American and a Russian arguing about their two countries, and the American said, look, in my country, I can walk into the Oval Office, I can pound the president's desk and say, Mr. President, I don't like the way you're running our country. And the Russian said, I can do that. The American said, you can? He says, yes. I can go into the Kremlin, to the general secretary's office, pound his desk and say, Mr. General Secretary, I don't like the way President Reagan's running his country. <laughs> An American dog and a Polish dog and a Russian dog, they were all having a visit, and the American dog was telling them about how things were in this country. He, he said, you know, you bark, and you have to, you bark long enough, and then somebody comes along and gives you some meat. And the Polish dog said, what's meat? The Russian dog says, what's bark? <laughs> the story of a fellow who was running for office as a Republican, and he was in a rural area, and it wasn't known to be Republican, and he stopped by a farm to do some campaigning. And when the farmer heard he was a Republican, his jaw dropped, and he said, wait right here till I go get Ma. She's never seen a Republican before. <laughs> So he got her, and the candidate looked around for a podium from which to give his speech, and the only thing he could find was a pile of that stuff that Bess Truman took 35 years trying to get Harry to call fertilizer. <laughs> so he got up on the mound, and when they came back, he gave his speech. And at the end of it, the farmer said, that's the first time I ever heard a Republican speech. And the candidate said, that's the first time I've ever given a Republican speech from a Democratic platform. <laughs> One of the great things about having you here is that I get to tell a farm joke. <laughs> now, first, I need a setting, but um, uh, Rick, uh, you're from Kansas, right? You bet. 
Okay, this takes place in Kansas. Uh, it, was, it was an old Kansas farmer there. He had a piece of creek bottom land that had never been developed at all. It was all rocks and brush and all messed up. And he started in on it, clearing it, the underbrush and hauling away the rocks. And then cultivating the soil there and he planted a garden everything from vegetables on to corn and and uh, it really became a garden spot and he was pretty proud of what he'd done so one sunday morning in church after the service he asked the preacher if he wouldn't stop by to have a look well the preacher arrived and he took one look and he said oh this is wonderful he said these are the biggest tomatoes i I've, I've ever seen praise the lord he said, those green beans, that squash, those melons. He said, the Lord really has blessed this place. And look at the height of that corn. He said, the God has really been, been good. And the old boy was listening to all this, and he was getting more and more fidgety. And finally, he blurted out, Reverend, I wish you could have seen it when the Lord was doing it by himself. <laughs> and the lawyer said to him, while you were lying there at the scene of the accident, didn't someone come up to you and ask you how you were feeling? And didn't you answer that you never felt better in your life? Well, he said, yeah, yes, I guess I remember that, that happening. Well, later on redirect, another lawyer was asking the question, and he said, what were the circumstances when you gave that answer as to how you felt? Well, he said, I was lying there, and he said, a car came up, and a deputy sheriff got out. He said, my horse was neighing with pain and kicking at two broken legs. The deputy sheriff put the gun in his ear and, and put the horse out of his misery. He said, my dog had a broken back and was whining with pain. And he went over, did the same thing, put the, there and shot him. And then he came over to me and said, now, how are you feeling? Just down at the entrance of his building, there was an elderly lady selling pretzels, and every day he'd go by and he'd put a quarter down and never take a pretzel, go on in. He was being very charitable, and this went on for some time. And he came along one day, put down his quarter, started, and she took him by the arm. And he looked at her and he said, oh, you probably want to know why for this full year I've been leaving 25 cents on the plate and not taking a pretzel. And she said, no, I just wanted to tell you that pretzels are 35 cents now. <laughs> grabbed a limb sticking out the side of the cliff and looked down 300 feet to the canyon floor below and then looked up and said, Lord, if there's anyone up there, give me faith. Tell me what to do. And a voice from the heavens said, if you have faith, let go. <laughs> he looked down at the canyon floor and then took another look up and says, is there anyone else up there? importance of communication and how much a part it plays in what you and I, what all of us are trying to do. And one day, a former place kicker with the Los Angeles Rams, who later became a sports announcer, Danny Villanueva, told me about communications. He said he'd been having dinner over at the home of a young ball player with the Dodgers. The young wife was bustling about getting the dinner ready. They were talking sports and the baby started to cry. And over her shoulder, his busy wife said to the ball player, changed the baby and he was a young fella and he was embarrassed in front of Danny and he said what do you mean change the baby I'm a ball player that's not my line of work and she turned around put her hands on her hips and she communicated <laughs> she said look Buster you lay the diaper out like a diamond you put second base on home plate you put the baby's bottom on the pitcher's mound you hook up first and third slide home underneath and if it starts to rain the game ain't called you start all over i thought you might like to say a few nice words to them <laughs> they're all from the press and radio and television maybe just a friendly little greeting would do <laughs> How about just a f word or two, something friendly, even one kind word? I'm thinking, I'm thinking. <laughs> on the back road on his way to look at some property and suddenly noticed down beside him was a chicken keeping pace with him and he was doing 60 miles an hour. <laughs> and suddenly the chicken spurted out ahead of him and it looked to him as if the chicken had three legs. And then it turned and went down a sign road and into a barnyard and the driver turned down that lane, drove into the barnyard, there was a farmer there, and he asked him, he said, did you see a 
chicken go by here? And the farmer said, yep. He says, did it have three legs? And the farmer says, yep. I raise them that way. I breed them. He says, you do? He said, how, how come? Well, he said, I just love the drumstick, and Ma always liked the drumstick, and now Junior's come along, and he likes it, and we just got tired of fighting over it, so I've been breeding three-legged chickens. And the driver said, well, how do they taste? He says, I don't know. I haven't been able to catch one yet. <laughs> this fellow they've nominated claims he's the new Thomas Jefferson. Well, let me tell you something. I knew Thomas Jefferson. He was a friend of mine. And Governor, you're no Thomas Jefferson. As soon as I get home to California, I plan to lean back, kick up my feet, and take a long nap. Well, come to think of it, things won't be all that different after all. Get to the emergency room for a treatable illness like asthma. They end up taking up a hospital bed. It costs when if you they just gave you gave them treatment early, and they got some treatment and a, a breathalyzer or an inhalator, not a breathalyzer. <laughs> what they'll say is, well, it costs too much money. But you know what? It would cost about it, it, it would cost about the same as what we would spend. It. Over the course of 10 years, it would cost what it would cost us. It, it, <laughs> All right. Okay. We're going to. The, it would cost us about the same as it would cost for about... Hold on one second. I can't hear myself. Uh, but I'm glad you're fired up, though. I'm glad. Oh, shut up. <laughs>